This question is actually more about wireless. Sure. Um, you, you seem to have done a great deal of, of kind of research and investigation into <laughs> the whole radio scene. Um, are, are you like a radio enthusiast on the side, or are you, not really? No. Not radios. You know, um, it's another happy accident. Um, I, most of my books, if not all of them, perhaps all of them, um, have all been given to me. I, I think of them all the the origin, the kernel of each one of my novels uh, has been a little gift that someone close around me has given me. And as I said, my first book, Box Nine, was a story that my wife told me one night when we were sorry about what happened to her one night at the post office when she was working as a night sorter. Um, Wireless, my second book, I can tell you the exact moment of uh, origin of that book. Um, I have a, uh, a sibling, a brother, who is uh, a, a, an interesting guy, uh, something of a character, uh, very much a, um, a guy who was always into the next emerging subculture, uh, a bit of a, 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 he has a soul of an anarchist, I would say. Okay. And he, um, uh, one day I was, uh, I, I was walking out of my office and I was about to get into my car and I heard a great uh, loud rumbling noise and my brother came screeching around the corner in, in like a 1965 uh, you know, Cadillac convertible or something, just, a, just some god-awful dinosaur <laughs> of a car that was spewing smoke, you know, on its last legs. And he pulled up in front of me, and literally what happened was he tossed a uh, tape, a cassette tape in the air to me and said, give this a listen, and then he vanished back into the, okay. the subculture. And, uh, and uh, you know, as a writer, something like that will pique your curiosity. Right. So I jumped in my car, and I, I popped the tape in, and what it was was a, um, it was a, a tape of, it was a bootleg tape of um, what at the time, this was probably in the, the mid-1980s, I guess, uh, a, a little fad that emerged um, that was called jamming. Uh, uh, these characters called themselves jammers, and they, they were anarchists, uh, in, in, uh, sort of cultural anarchists. Right. And what they did was um, they didn't like the idea that um, any governing body could uh, uh, carve up and license the airwaves. So the FCC. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So what these guys did in the, uh, the late 70s and early 80s, I guess, was they would, they would uh, you know, uh, raid Radio Shack and get themselves some equipment. And, and they took delight in, um, they would set up shop somewhere and they would bump uh, licensed uh, official stations off the air and with their often nonsensical or uh, profane <laughs> broadcasts. And I, I was completely unaware of it. It was the first that I had uh, heard of the sort of pirate radio movement. Right. And uh, again, within about five minutes of hearing this bootleg tape, uh, the germ of a story began to sort of percolate in my brain a little bit. Okay. And uh, within weeks I said, oh, I, I'm going to get a novel out this, I think. Yours is proof that I would say that the romantic and unsettling um, view of organized crime still exists. <laughs> um, what, what is your inspiration for, you know, Buzz Coat, um, Frankie Loftus, uh, yeah. all, all the, the, the Gray Roaches and the Herman Kinsky? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are a lot of gangs in the books. Uh, and I think that, uh, again, I don't know that there's one answer to that. I guess one thing that I would say to you was, you know, uh, I, I am a uh, American male of a certain age, and which uh, inherently means that uh, you know I grew up a uh, Godfather fanatic, <laughs> you know, can, can, like every yeah. peer that I had, you know, you find a fifty-year-old guy, they can quote the movie uh, dialogue to you verbatim. Um, so there was that always that sense of you know uh, growing up. Um, that sense of, of a pop narrative that tried to talk about American power structures using sort of pulp material. Okay. I think that had something of an influence on me. Beyond that, I would say that um, part of the noir tradition, um, you know, I, I often think that the credo of noir is, uh, I first came across this um, uh, great noir writer, uh, Jim Thompson. Of the, of the 1950s, uh, the guy who wrote The Killer Inside Me and The Getaway and uh, Savage Night, um, he, he said uh, there's only one real 
story plot, and that is uh, nothing is as it appears. And I think you can take that as as a uh, as sort of the credo of what the noir story is all about, um, to some degree. Uh, and and so it, it seemed to me as I was writing, I, I wanted to write from the beginning, even before I had a name for it. I wanted to write about a uh, decaying Rust Belt American metropolis. Um, uh, because I, it, it seemed like um, a great metaphor for what, uh, for a lot of different things, actually. But it was also sort of, it resonated with the world in which I came of age. Um, sort of that um, somewhat cynical uh, post 60s uh, Vietnam Watergate. Uh, nothing is what it appears to be. Right. And in, in constructing that um, city, uh, which I came to call Quinsigamond, it occurred to me that, um, you know, if, if uh, nothing is as it appears to be is the credo of noir, it is the uh, constitution of the city of Quinsigamond. Uh, and, and, and so uh, Quinsigamond, uh, though apparently run, you know, by an a, a egomaniacal mayor and a, a craven city council of some sort, uh, the actual power structure of the city are these um, sort of ethnic gangs that operate in very uh, much a tribal fashion. And um, I've had a, just a ball building different, you know, I, I divided the city up, you know, into, into right. different uh, ethnic conclaves, and then I gave each, uh, the, the individual who runs each one is called the neighborhood mayor mm -hmm. um, in the books. and. Uh, each one has some sort of a an army of street muscle or, or a gang that that uh, of button men that, that sort of uh, facilitate his his desires and, and needs. Right. So I guess that's where it came from. Okay. How are you able to make them so real? <laughs> well, thank you. This, this <laughs> I guess game. that's a matter of opinion. I guess. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, that's just. A, I guess I want to say that. Uh, I think there there is a reader who that it does surprise them when um, uh, you know sort of a, a middle class you know schmuck like myself can create sort of these very cold blooded uh, sociopathic characters um, and my answer to that is always um, that's that's my job you know that's sort of uh, that's what you do when you're a writer I, I always remember how instructive it was when um, my first book came out and uh, I, I was doing a local signing and a, uh, a guy I hadn't seen for a long time, uh, an old pal, uh, sort of came through. He had read the book already and he came through the line and he said, hey, I gotta ask you, you know, growing up, I had no idea, when did you become such a gun fanatic? You know, there's all this stuff about guns and you know, the books. And I said, I, I don't know anything about guns, you know, I don't know, I own a gun, I don't, and he said, but there's all this stuff. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I went to the Worcester Public Library for an hour and took notes. That's okay. what we do. You know, that's what the, the uh, as I've said to, to writing students uh, in the past, you know, your job is you, you don't need to know everything in the world. You just have to convince the reader that you do. You know, right. your, your job is to create that sense of versatility. You, you uh, and uh, the, the other thing I would say about that is that I am a, uh, I mean, I like research. I'm sort of a, you know, I enjoy wandering in a library and letting one book lead me to another book to another book. So it's just, it's a function of the job, you know? Okay. Because, I, I mean, just looking at some of those bags, I, I can just literally, I mean, it's it's one thing to read something, <laughs> but having it actually make an image in your, in your brain, it just, I don't know. Well, the, the other thing that I can say, speak to about that is that, I, I can't speak for any other writers, I guess. I, the way that I operate is uh, pretty instinctually. Um, my gut determines a lot of uh, choices that I make. So that what will often happen will be, um, if, if I'm constructing either a, uh, you know, I'm working on, I'm pulling together a character or a gang, as you say, you know, I will, I will read, um, well, in wireless, for instance, I'll give you a, a, an example. Um, I remember reading several books about uh, the Khmer Rouge and the 
atrocities in uh, Cambodia in the 70s. And, um, and, and I remember, you know, you don't know what you're going to need. So you sort of wade into uh, lots of research material. And then your gut recognizes it when you see something. I remember reading some book on, uh, on Cambodia and coming to a, a, a detail where uh, Khmer Rouge used to, um, you know, they were big on, uh, one, one way of uh, eliminating their enemies was to douse them in benzene, right? and boom! So, and that's the kind of thing, you read that paragraph and you go, oh, well, there's gonna be a scene in the book where that happens, you know, right. obviously. Um, but I've read, you know, I, when I was doing um, uh, re research on my, my latest book, The Resurrectionist, I read books about motorcycle gangs and Hell's Angels. Now, the, the gang that I create, the Abominations, they're very, uh, they're over the top. It's, it's uh, very much the book is, uh, to some degree, phantasmagorical. So I, I let myself take as many liberties as I want. As long as I have sort of what, what I'm striving for is this underpinning of uh, specific, uh, specifically chosen details that sort of give you this foundation that once you have it in place, then you can do all kinds of crazy things. This, this is kind of more of a, not necessarily a personal question, but it, it, one of my own personal curiosities about um, one of the things that you incorporated in the Skin Palace and Word Made Flesh, the floating kitchen. Yeah. Where, where, where did that come from? Was That's that... going back a ways. Um, that is not, I don't believe that that is, um, you know, the concept, I think, is just a, a notebook idea. You know? Okay. I think I, I was probably sitting at a red light somewhere and said, you know, sort of a restaurant that moved around, you know. And then, of course, the bounce on, you know, having ways movable feast, you know, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole notion of that. I, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> it's been so long since I reread uh, that book. Um, I think my my real world model for where it, uh, it's set. I think with, with Skin Palace, we're talking about, isn't yes. it? And uh, I think I, I use Bancroft Tower. Yes, uh, as as the inspiration for that, because again, from that same era, you know, just, just as I've mentioned, uh, the Paris Cinema and. Union Station, Bancroft Tower was definitely a uh, sort of a hangout spot when when I was a kid. You know, right. that, was, that was sort of a place we'd congregate and uh, get into some trouble. And, <laughs> okay, I was just wondering make a nuisance of ourselves. The, the, the concept of there being just a, a restaurant up there, uh, just it, it, it <laughs> would you eat me. there? Oh, I actually have eaten there, not, not from a restaurant, but that's that's why I said, you know, you hey, go. that's another person picking up on that. But um, that was, you know, just a personal curiosity, that's all. Okay. This... The, in Word Made Flesh, there was the, the secondary storyline of the July Suite and right. the Schiller. Yeah. Um, and how it goes on to later kind of come out that that was chronicled in a book where the cover was actually made of human flesh. Right. Um, is there kind of like a hidden statement about the power of the literature? Probably. Um, you know, that that is that it's sort of interesting in that Word Made Flesh, you know, I, it's tough to differentiate between any of your books uh, in terms of your attachment to them. Uh, but if I were pressed, you know, if you put a gun to my head right now, I, I would likely say Word Made Flesh is my favorite of my books. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that it, the intention when I began that book was um, to write something very commercial very quickly. Uh, in fact, I mean, to digress just for a moment, it, just because I get a kick out of the story, um, you know, I, I, uh, I had finished um, The Skin Palace and my agent was looking for my next book and right at the time that I had the idea, the, w what I thought was going to be the idea for, for uh, Word Made Flesh, uh, I discovered, my, my wife and I discovered she was pregnant. And so uh, I, I sort of grabbed a calendar, and I, knowing that once I had two young children in the house, my writing time was going to be uh, minimal at best, uh, I plotted out, you know, for, from that moment until uh, my wife's due date, uh, how many days I had, 
and then how many pages I needed to write each day to complete a manuscript. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as you know, uh, as fate would have it, uh, my son was born ten days early, and I had one <laughs> chapter left to finish. Now, the beautiful thing about that is, uh, and, and this is instructive to some degree to, to writers, I think, young writers. Um, I couldn't write another word for probably six to nine months before I sort of got my equilibrium back and got some time back and began to sleep again. <laughs> and um, in that six to nine months, what I had imagined to be, what I had hoped to be, a very commercial, uh, mechanical, uh, plot-driven bullet of a book uh, changed utterly. You know, other uh, layering sort of and influences began to exert pressure on it, and it turned into a completely, you know, that, that subplot sort of became very important and elaborate and, and complex uh, to some degree. Um, where the, you know, was, it, this is one of those, uh, this is another, another aspect of that is, again, to refer to the notebook. Um, what I recall is um, I'm, I'm big on sort of collecting titles, you know. If a good title occurs to me, even if I don't have an idea to attach to it, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just write that. And I, and I had, for years, I had written down one day in the, note, in the notebook um, a title that was Manuscript Bound in Human Skin. And I think I had read, I think that came from there, I, I could have this completely wrong, but I, I think there is a collection of such volumes at the Harvard Library. Okay. Uh, I think I read an article and said, oh, you know. And when it came time, when, during that sort of fallow period where I was not writing, when I still had one chapter left to finish Word May Flesh, I sort of kept dwelling on, on the meaning of what does it mean if a, you know, to, to bind a, a manuscript, a story, a narrative inside human skin? What does that mean? What are the suggestions that arise out of that concept? And uh, you know, much brooding and rumination uh, by a sleep-deprived brain later, <laughs> it ended up in the, you know, the book took a very different form and it ended up a different story than the, the story that we have now. Okay. So, like we said before, I mean, a lot of people have kind of classified your works into the noir crime kind, yeah. of, kind of category. Um, but I, I see, or I saw rather, that a, lo a lot of your earlier works had kind of a cop and robber kind of feel. Yeah. Kind of an, an authority figure of the law with right? interacting with the city. Um, in The Resurrectionist, it, it, it kind of felt different. And I, I was wondering kind of like, what, what brought on the change? Um, I, I would say, I guess, just natural evolution of where I'm sort of just chasing my own tail a lot of the time. Um, and I, you know, um, I love the noir stuff. I've read tons of it over the last 20 years or so, especially that sort of American mid-century paperback writer, you know, 60,000 word lion book, you know, gold medal book, J Jim Thompson, David Gudis, Gil Brewer. I love those guys. Um, and I played with a lot of those devices and a lot of those conventions through the earlier books. Um, but I think what, what has happened is I, uh, I am allowing myself at this point, um, you know, foolishly or otherwise, to simply follow uh, the stories kind of where they want to go uh, in the city where it's going. Uh, again, I never, it was, it was something of a, an accident the way the early books were, um, you know, constructed and marketed. In that, you know, and an example I can give you is I had contracted um, for uh, two books after after Box Nine, and uh, Wireless came out, and I was working at the time that Wireless was published. I was working on the Skin Palace. Mm -hmm. And I turned in, a few months after Wireless was published, I turned in uh, the first draft of uh, The Skin Palace to my agent. And what I recall is him calling me up pretty soon after he received it. And he said, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting book, but you signed a contract for sort of this noir crime mystery hard-boiled book, and there are no criminals in this. There are no... <laughs> 
cops in this. There were no gangsters. There were no, um, you know, you're sort of laughing a little bit. And what happened is, you know, I, uh, the entire, if you've read Skin Pals, that entire secondary story of the Kinski family, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jay. Herman Kinski and his, his son Jacob and his cousin, um, that was all layered in afterwards. You know, okay. the, the book originally was just about, you know, uh, Sylvia, about this, this young woman uh, who's sort of in the midst of uh, metamorphosis and she, she finds an old camera that has some uh, curious images on it and I sort of just chased that. And it was much more of a, uh, the first draft was much more of sort of played with gothic conventions much more than uh, noir or had boiled, although there was some, probably some connection between them. Uh, at this point, you know, all bets are off. I don't really know. I mean, the state of publishing is insane right now anyway. Uh, and I'm just, I mean, you sort of have to keep the original reasons why you started doing this curious activity in the first place uh, in the forefront of your heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I often say, you know, the books are just the, the end product of this very quirky pre-dawn hobby that I have, you know, this very strange activity that kind of just gives me a particular kind of joy and meaning. Uh, and since that's the case, uh, I'm really beholden to just, you know, sort of tramping along after whatever story captivates me. Okay. So... I mean, what, what I would say is that uh, looking forward, uh, I, I continue to, I believe that my stories will continue to be set in Quinsigamon. Mm -hmm. And the nature of Quinsigamon is that it is a, a sort of a, a noir machine. Right. So to that extent, there will always be these noir elements in it. But, you know, to give you an example, I, I wrote a novel that we, I never even took to market uh, after uh, Word Day Flesh that had no noir or prime uh, or hard-boiled elements to it whatsoever. You know, it was kind of a satirical road novel you know, okay. that sort of originated in Quinsigamon and ended in Quinsigamon. And it, it was uh, completely out of character. And, and we never, you know, my agent, we had a conversation when it was done. You know, I spent a year and a half or about 400 page draft. And he said, yeah, it's an interesting book, but, uh, you know, it will only serve to confuse whatever readership you have managed to build over the course of five books. Right. They'll, they'll say, why does it have Jack O'Connell's name on it? It's not a Jack O'Connell. <laughs> so I'm just going to chase story. You know, I'm okay. going to chase whatever stories are, you know, appeal to me or that, or, or that I guess the better way to say it is the stories that I feel compelled. Not exactly a large one, or, or it, it is actually in, in the Resurrectionist, but only once or twice in some of the others. Jim Henna. Yeah. Um, what, what, what was kind of your aim with Jim Henna? Well, uh, you know, I, I guess <laughs> I come out of a, I come out of a real, uh, I mean, I don't think I was aware of this until I was an adult, but I come out of a, a fairly... Uh, full-blooded, let's say, uh, Catholic background. You know, I, I, you know, I attended Catholic schools for uh, 17 years, and, and you know, at a time when it was, uh, you know, I, I, I still had big, scary nuns and black habits, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and there was very much a, uh, and, you know, often often Irish nuns. Uh, and I think there was a big, that had an impact, that very fact had an impact on my, on the development of my imagination. So that uh, there is a, um, there's sort of a biblical component to some of the themes that repeatedly and continually, you know, obsess me. Uh, and that, that whole, the, the whole sort of basic Catholic cosmology of, uh, you know, Light versus dark, you know, good versus evil, either or, one zero. You know, the whole, the whole that whole sort of binary, oppositional binary dialectic. Uh, you know, I, I I sometimes wonder if that's what sort of determined the nature of uh, 
<laughs> a particular psychosis that we might call my work so far. Um, and that's just that's where Gehenna comes from. It's just a, it's just a you know uh, it, it's just another reference to um, the dark aspect of reality. Let's okay. say I guess. Right. Okay.